Okay, hello, hello everyone. First of all, let me welcome you to today's virtual listening session on hunger and poverty. It's really um, a shame and disgrace that I have to say in America, a listening session on hunger and poverty, um, which just um, tells you where we are in our country. But let me just thank my constituents, uh, including 500 of them who share their stories of how hunger has impacted them. And I wanna thank Liz Gomez, uh, from the Alameda County Food Bank, who's doing a phenomenal job at the food bank uh, under uh, really uh, extreme circumstances, not enough resources, but a lot of love and a lot of unity and a lot of giving at Alameda County. And so Liz, why don't you take it away? And thank you again so much, Liz, for being with us. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's live listening session on hunger and poverty, hosted by the Office of Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Alameda County Community Food Bank, and the California Association of Food Banks. My name is Liz Gomez, Director of Client Services at Alameda County Community Food Bank, and it is my honor to serve as your moderator for this evening. The purpose of tonight's listening session is to inform the upcoming White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. With one in four Alameda County residents experiencing some level of food insecurity, it is crucial that the voices of community members who are most disproportionately impacted by food insecurity, economic exclusion, and systemic racism are centered at this conference. This conversation could not have come at a more urgent time. The Food Bank has been gathering community member stories in preparation for the conference. Community members have been candid about how the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and economic emergency is impacting their lives and the need for investment in structural changes to achieve equity. One community member expressed their fear that absent immediate action, issues such as housing burden, and the inflation would exacerbate. Make no mistake, if we are to meet the conference's goal of ending hunger by 2030, we need to take decisive action now. This will require working for systemic change, such as achieving universally free school meals nationwide. We must also protect democracy and voting rights to ensure that our government is accountable to everyone. And of course, we must protect, strengthen, and ensure equitable access to SNAP, our nation's most effective anti-hunger program. So that is why we are grateful for the leadership of Congresswoman Barbara Lee, alongside Alameda County Community Food Bank and California Association of Food Banks, Congresswoman Lee affirms that eradicating hunger requires centering racial equity. And we are grateful for the many years Congresswoman Lee has spent fighting to protect and strengthen critical nutrition programs such as SNAP, including her current bill, H.R. 1753, the Improving Access to Nutrition Act, which lifts SNAP's unjust three-month time limit and ensures that all people have access to nutrition assistance and stay healthy while seeking full-time work. The stories shared by our panelists later this evening are critical to finding real solutions to eradicating hunger, and we thank Congresswoman Lee for fighting alongside us. And with that, it is, I'd like to pass it back to Congresswoman Barbara Lee for her opening remarks. Thank you. Well, Liz, thank you so much for those opening remarks of yours, because you really uh, set the table and you put the framework and the issues in context of why we're doing this listening session uh, tonight. And let me thank the, again, the Food Research and Action Center, uh, California Food Banks, Alameda County Community Food Bank, everyone for their efforts to combat uh, hunger through all of your programs, your advocacy, and for coordinating this event with us. And I want to also thank my staff for uh, doing such a phenomenal job uh, in pulling this together. They do work 24 seven for the 13th Congressional District. So thank you all. Let me also take a moment to let, thank and lift up the Poor People's Campaign, its membership and Bishop William Barber and Reverend Theo Liz Theo Harris for their leading the call to uplift the voices of the 140 people who are poor, low wealth, and or living one emergency away from economic ruin. 
prior to today's session, I sent a letter to the president to uplift our constituents' stories. And thank you, Liz, for mentioning that because it's so important to ensure that the development of the White House National Strategy on Hunger and the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition and Health are inclusive of my constituents' input. I also urge the president to deeply examine the root causes of hunger, proclaim structural racism as a barrier to access to nutrition, discuss nutrition-related uh, health disparities, and build solutions from input with people with lived experiences on hunger. During a very difficult period, I was a young single mother on public assistance and um, received food stamps while attending college and raising my two sons. So fighting poverty and food insecurity by expanding vital safety net programs is a very personal priority for me because it truly was a bridge over troubled waters. And as chair now of the Leaders uh, Task Force on Poverty and Opportunity, I did introduce, uh, which Liz mentioned, H.R. 1753, the Improving Access to Nutrition Act of 2021, which would repeal certain SNAP work requirements and expand access. As a member of the House Appropriations Committee, it, which we fund uh, the federal government, I'm really working uh, day and night to implement, and this is very exciting, a national food as medicine pilot program to improve access and quality of health foods to prevent and to heal, heal this nation, of the course, our people uh, in this effort as food as medicine. And I have to salute it, and I'm thinking tonight about Supervisor Wilma Chan when we hosted Secretary Becerra uh, in Oakland, and um, gosh, Wilma was such a champion um, for lifting people out of poverty, for all kinds of safety net issues, helping people move from uh, poverty to to the middle class. And it, it's hard to imagine that she's not with us. But we talked that day and, and she had this idea, which we followed up with, to develop a pilot project uh, in my district, of course. We want it there. Uh, food as medicine. And so hopefully in Wilma's honor, we'll be able to, if we can deal with the political fights around what we're dealing with here, we can establish that as a pilot project. The White House Conference on Hunger in September is a prime opportunity to uplift the voices of poor and underserved communities. Only by coming together will we develop a national strategy that fixes our broken food systems and ends hunger and nutrition-related health disparities. You know, I for several years did the food stamp challenge and lived off of $4, 450 a day for a week. And I am telling you, uh, the um, food that I could only buy with that amount of money, which people on SNAP benefits uh, have to purchase, they're, they're not healthy food, full of sodium, canned foods. Uh, they didn't have the type of nutritional value that fresh fruits and vegetables had. And it, it was really uh, quite a struggle for those of us members of Congress who did this food stamp challenge. And it really reminded the public that uh, this is not um, a, an intellectual issue. This is a real issue for so many people who are food insecure. And so we're committed to trying to finally and once and for all address food security by addressing, like Liz said, the systemic and the um, structural issues around poverty and food insecurity. The last conference, the last White House conference actually uh, was what, over 50 years ago, I think, since uh, the White House convened a conference on uh, hunger as a national priority. And the last conference sparked major improvements and expansions to federal nutrition programs like SNAP, SNAP and WIC but we now face new food security challenges that require new solutions. I mean, 50 years is a long time to, to um, wait for another White House conference on um, hunger. And so finally, we're gonna be able to do this in my district. I'm so proud of everyone. We'll have a lot of input into that. A national strategy to end hunger uh, must be centered on promoting policies for the 140 million poor and people of color. The strategy must aggressively call for making healthy foods more accessible, expanding federal nutrition programs, and providing targeted support to communities of color and low-income communities that, communities that are disproportionately impacted by hunger. All who impact our communities, Congress, the president, local governments, state governments, 
community-based organizations, private businesses, we all must work together to disrupt. And I mean, we have to disrupt these systems of oppression to end food insecurity. So thank you all for being here. I look forward to listening to our constituent stories today. And Liz, thank you again for moderating this and for really doing the heavy lifting for all of us. Thank you, Congresswoman Lee. It is my pleasure to be joining you here today. I'd now like to introduce Itzul Gutierrez from California Association of Food Banks, who will provide a policy overview for us. Itzul. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, let's see. And apologies. Here we go. You'll see. Um, Go, and I think we're going to be. Okay. Apologies. There we go. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Itzul Gutierrez, Senior Policy Advocate at the California Association of Food Banks. And I'll be going over <laughs> focusing on uh, what we know as CalFresh here in California, but SNAP nationally, um, and what we're seeing in California with hunger and, again, the power that SNAP has. Um, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, and how we can, uh, you know, lift this up for the White House Conference on Hunger. Okay, so hunger in California, what does that look like? Well, as, as uh, you know, Congresswoman Lee says, it's, it's just, it's horrible that we're still talking about this and that this is still happening. Um, here in California, 8 million Californians, or 20% of our population are experiencing food insecurity and with deep disparities for Black and Latinx people. That means that one in five Californians um, are, are, you know, experiencing hunger and, you know, from low-income communities of color who are living with the toxic stress and trauma of not knowing where their next meal is coming from, even if they eventually manage to eat. Um, this crisis that demands um, an urgent whole of government response, especially to uh, the root causes of systemic racism, poverty, and other barriers to prosperity at the heart of hunger. Um, so zooming out, or zooming back in here, what does that look like in Alameda County? Um, hunger in Alameda, we have one in four Alameda County residents that are experiencing uh, hunger or at risk of hunger. And this is provided by our partners here at Alameda Community Food Bank on this statistic. So what we're seeing as well is the rising cost of food. Um, California food banks are spending three times much more money on purchasing food. And community members on this call are on the front lines of the rising cost of food, gas, rent. Um, unfortunately, some in DC are using inflation to push against investing in our programs. You know, they're saying that government has done so much already. Um, yet we know this is not the case. We saw how effective the food safety net was during COVID. Um, when we invested in it, uh, that's what kept hunger from rising. Um, and, but, you know, we are so glad that, you know, thank you, Congresswoman Lee, for leading the way and pushing for full funding for SNAP, TFAP, and all of the anti-hunger programs. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, as mentioning, you know, the rise in hunger, that means increasing demand at food banks. So what we're hearing from California food banks is that they're right now more than 1.5 times pre-pandemic uh, folks are coming uh, to food banks. So, you know, this should be front page news that this need has been going up. But, you know, it's hard to sustain interest after two years into the pandemic. It's hard to keep that headline, unfortunately. And again, you know, the cost of living, uh, it has been going up and that's putting pressure on families and folks, making it harder. So, you know, keeping that in mind, you know, your stories are powerful evidence as to why, you know, it's important that we need more, uh, that we need this government response and to, that we need to improve and strengthen federal food programs. Um, what about what about SNAP in the district? What does that look like? Well, you know, a SNAP um, last year brought 82,800 participants uh, participating in the program. That's 11% of the district. 
that is receiving SNAP. So that comes at number 26 here in California. And, and when you look at what that generates, you know, those benefits that families and folks go and spend at their local grocery stores, that, you know, that generates an economic stimulus. Um, there's over five, 506 authorized EBT retailers across the district um, that uh, folks go in and use their SNAP benefits to get groceries. Um, so those 506, that includes restaurants. So if you are an older adult or a person living with a disability in Alameda County, you can use your SNAP CalFresh to buy hot food. Um, and we want to build on that, you know, what, what's happening here in Alameda County um, to make that sure it's statewide. During the pandemic, there was flexibilities to SNAP that has allowed families and folks to receive additional benefits as well as expanding access to college students. And um, there's been other responses, as um, you know, mentioned earlier, like pandemic EBT and universal school meals that Liz was mentioning. And these programs, they work. Uh, you know, when national data shows that, you know, we again, we held hunger rates from going up. And that's something that we need to continue to remind um, Congress and our government of, of that and why it's so important uh, to maintain these programs and strengthen them. All right. So. What are opportunities to address hunger? Well, um, you know, as, as uh, Congresswoman Lee was mentioning, the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health is um, coming up, and the last one was in host was hosted 50 years ago, um, so it's been a long time. Um, but we are excited to see that it's um, happening again, and it's projected to happen in September. They'll be unveiling an agenda, and you know, the White House has an ambitious goal to end hunger and increase healthy eating and physical activity by 2030. Uh, so keep that in mind as you share, uh, in addition to your stories, your recommendations. You know, let's be bold on how we can end hunger. Um, so the White House is seeking input from people with lived experience uh, and um, as well as um, stakeholders to inform the agenda. So folks can submit their stories and recommendations. There's a Google form that uh, Congresswoman Lee has, and she's uh, shared it out via email, and we'll try to drop that in the chat for you all so that you can make sure to put your stories, share your stories, um, and as well as ideas and recommendations to end hunger. Just remember that your voice matters because you have a champion like Barbara Lee. And coming out of the White House conference, hopefully we will have a national strategy to solve hunger. So again, that's why conversations like these today are very important and we need to continue having them. Another opportunity to address hunger is the Farm Bill. Um, that is a law that authorizes most federal uh, policies governing food and ag programs, which includes SNAP, CalFresh. And, you know, the same ideas that you have for strengthening CalFresh, SNAP, uh, TFAP, which is the Emergency Food Assistance Program, as well as other programs, can be addressed in the Farm Bill. So it's a great opportunity to put this into action as well as this comes up. So once the um, White House uh, conference happens in September, you know, the Farm Bill will be kicking into high gear. Uh, so uh, let's continue that and um, asking for the strengthening of SNAP and TFAP and other programs. And we want to continue to work with uh, Congresswoman Lee and Alameda Community Food Bank to continue to our community voices to support um, her leadership and to maximize uh, what we can do in the next Farm Bill. And community discussions like this, centering CalFresh customers, uh, working with farmers, retailers, colleges, and others who touch the program and, and can tell the story of SNAP, CalFresh, and why it matters and how we can improve it. And then last here, you know, we have federal policies to address hungers. Uh, there are bills, marker bills that are, um, you know, have solutions to strengthen and improve SNAP. And you know, we'll start off with you know HR 1753, which Liz was already mentioning. Um, which you know, thank you so much, Congresswoman Lee, for continuing to lead this effort and to end the racist time limit on food aid for adults who are struggling to find full-time work. Uh, so this is a very important marker bill, and we're so grateful for you leading this. And there's also HR 4077, um, which would raise benefits to the low-cost food plan, uncap the shelter deduction. Um, which is huge in the district, and also boost the minimum benefit, um, which will help older adults, working families, and so much more. Um, so there's also the um, uh, HR 1919, which will expand 
uh, access to college students, and then HR 5227, which would expand access for immigrants. Um, so if you are not in the district, please do reach out to your member of Congress and make sure that they are co-sponsors on these bills. Uh, we need to stay strong on SNAP um, and get co-sponsors on this. All right, so thank you so much for letting me share more. Um, we'd love to continue the conversation. There's my information online if you wanna connect via email um, or on Twitter, uh, check out our, our uh, website. Again, we'd love to continue the conversation and any questions feel free to reach out and I'll pass it back to Liz. I will now introduce our community member panelists for this evening. I will call on each of you one at a time. Um, and this is a friendly reminder to please keep your story to three minutes or less. The first person I'd like to introduce is Nell Myhand, pronouns she, her. Nell is the quad chair for California Poor People's Campaign. Nell. Okay, it looks like Nell may not be. Oh, there is oh, Nell. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So thank you so much. Sorry, I was on mute. So still learning the tech skills of the, you know, the period that we're in. So I was uh, saying that we just have deep appreciation for the invitation to be here again with you, Congresswoman Lee, and for your longstanding commitment to represent those of us who are on the spectrum of poverty, um, who are your constituents as well and really excited that the White House is taking up the question of how are we gonna solve this problem of hunger in the United States? Because in the richest country in the history of the world, there is no reason that it is, is acceptable that anyone here should be hungry. And so I um, come as a, a person who is impacted by poverty. I have lived on the spectrum of poverty in different places throughout the course of my life. I have experienced homelessness. I was foreclosed on uh, by Chase Bank in the uh, early part of the, well, the second decade. And, um, and so then I moved around at like 12 times in two years until uh, I finally found stable housing. I'm currently living in subsidized housing on Section 8. And it's ironic that you, I got invited to speak here. I just returned from Washington, D.C., where the Poor People's Campaign had the largest gathering of poor and low wealth people, poor, some of whom have uh, no income, low income um, and low wealth, the largest assembly in the, in the history of the country. And we were there to say that we demand to be seen and represented and have the needs and concerns of the 140 million be addressed. The Poor People's Campaign is picking up on the radical legacy of Dr. King, who between the um, April 4th, 1967, when he delivered the Beyond Vietnam speech in which he said, you know, a country that spends more on, uh, on its military year after year than it does on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And be between that and the time that he was assassinated, he called for a poor people's campaign. And he said that, you know, we are going to Washington, D.C. That did happen. Even in the wake of his assassination, people gathered on the National Mall, 3,000 strong from all across the country with a list of demands, some of which we still have in effect. So, so we recognize that the importance of, uh, of raising our voices and demanding that we be seen and valued. Um, so I want to just say that after I got back from D.C., after the event was over, two things happened. One was that I went to visit my sister, who is living with her daughter, and my heart broke open. Here we are, you know, with our demands that we have policies that lift the load of poverty, and then I go to my sister's house and I hear her daughter negotiating with a doctor about getting a, a prescription refilled 
and they won't refill the prescription because there's an outstanding bill. And so, right. So, you know, there's, there's like the, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's like, here's my sister without something that she needs because she doesn't have resource. So then I come home and I received a notice that my section eight was being terminated. So, so I went from, from there where, you know, my folks are living in much deeper poverty than I am, but I am still living in poverty such that I need section eight. And I got a notice that my section eight was being terminated. I want to tell you that I, just before this meeting, I got a notice that that was being rescinded, but it's that kind of instability that contributes to the question of why we're hungry. Because if my rent went up again, then my ability to access clean and healthy food would be impacted more than it already is. And so this conversation is so critically important at this particular time. We want to um, say that the that poverty is a policy decision. It is not the result of the individual circumstances, faults, failures, successes, or accomplishments. It is because we live in a society where we have policies that create and keep us um, living without the, the most basic things that we need. And so I want to lift up, you know, the the importance. I was I was with you, Congresswoman Lee, when you released a roadmap to reducing child poverty in 2019. And so, you know, we know that the child tax credit works. You mentioned it then that it was an important piece of what needs to be done, um, expanding the housing voucher program, expanding SNAP benefits. So we already know what needs to be done to address hunger. And what we lack is the political will. And so that's why I'm really, you know, honored to be here to say that the Poor People's Campaign and the, the 140 million that we represent are committed to uh, nonviolent direct action to put pressure on our Congress to see us address our needs um, and provide us with policies that lift the load of poverty. Thank you, Nell. Thank you for sharing your story um, and your insights with us. Next, I'd like to introduce Candace Elder, pronouns she, her, founder and executive director, the East Oakland Collective. Candace. Good evening, everyone. Again, Candace Elder, um, founder and executive director of the East Oakland Collective. And this issue of the intersection of poverty, hunger, um, economic instability, even um, transportation insecurity is really deep to the work that the East Oakland Collective does and the community members that we serve so much that I'm calling in from Florida while on vacation just uh, to join this very important town hall. Um, so much love and respect to Congress member Lee for all the work that you're doing and to everyone on this panel. Um, EOC, we serve over 200 households a week who are um, experiencing food insecurity, um, whether that, that they are unhoused, seniors, disabled, veterans, um, large families, small families, um, and what we've seen is hunger be exacerbated by COVID-19. COVID-19 just really just further increased all the issues that our, our impoverished communities have already been struggling with and facing. So the black and brown families that we serve, they have, they, they are on SNAP, you know, but in, in um, neighborhoods and communities like East Oakland, um, we have a, a, a access problem. You know, so you can have SNAP benefits, but there's no good grocery store. There's no fresh produce, you know, um, that is walking distance. If you're transportation insecure, which a lot of the um, community members that we serve, they walk to our distribution hub to receive groceries and to receive meals. And there are seniors who can no longer cook. And some of them may not fall into um the, the income bracket to receive uh, benefits, but they still need the food. They can no longer cook for themselves. A lot of our seniors don't have um, the family support, you know, to bring them groceries, you know, so they walk with their grandbabies, you know, or they, or they, they drive sometimes, they catch the bus, you know, to receive fresh groceries and to receive meals. We have seniors, we have disabled, we definitely have our unhoused folks living curbside across Oakland who we deliver food to, 
because um, of the lack of transportation and the need. We serve fresh catered meals every single week. Before we lost our funding, <laughs> we were we were serving meals, fresh catered meals. And these are meals that people um, couldn't afford in, in, in the restaurant. So we, you know, had the funding um, up until March of this year to be able to buy these meals every single day and to serve it to folks. And they relied on these meals. It broke our hearts. It broke the community's hearts when the funding ran out, when really government and other agencies said, hey, we're moving on to a different issue. We're moving on to a different avenue of addressing food insecurity. And we're not funding uh, prepared meals anymore. These prepared meals also, um, you know, kept black and brown businesses open and they're culturally relevant, you know. So we're seeing food insecurity at a larger level than we've ever seen before. We actually um, expanded our, our service base. Before we were just focused on our unhoused folks who we know don't have the ability to cook, you know, um, don't have the ability to even receive groceries. So they really rely on hot meals. But we saw the need of our, our, our seniors, of our veterans, of our folks who are disabled, um, and we really were pushing, and we're still pushing. We are not going to, um, just because a one funder or because uh, a one agency says this is not important anymore, we're still going to keep up the fight to make sure that people have a nutritious meal, especially when you're in a food desert such as... Um, East Oakland. We want to alleviate um, food insecurity um, for our black and brown folks who are experiencing it. And for our folks, we, suggest, we just saw kind of like the, the economic instability widen for more different um, social economic groups of people. And we want to continue to serve them as well, even if it means every day we are out, you know, searching um, for, for funding to be able to feed people um, searching and, and looking at policy, you know, looking at ways in which we can help spark this movement because food is at the crux of our, our families, or of our households. It's how, it's how we bond, it's how we commune with, with one another. Um, we, food brings the people in. Food brings all the 200 plus families we see each week at our office doorstep on 78th and MacArthur. And we also give wraparound services. We also help address the transportation needs, you know, with um, bus passes and clipper cards and delivery service, you know, um, and, and wellness. Health is health is wealth. You know, um, food and wellness are really tied together. So we also, during COVID, saw that need and combined the food with with massage and Reiki and blood pressure. Um, checks and we brought in those services and combine that with the meals, combine that with the groceries. Um, so I'm happy today to be on um, this listening session in order so that we can, we can talk about these things. Thank you. Thank you, Candice. Thank you for joining us from afar. Um, we have a few more speakers. Um, if I could please ask you to keep your, um, your uh, stories to under three minutes. Uh, next up is Lena Ganim, pronouns she, her. Lena is executive director and founder of Saba Grocers Initiative. Hi, yes. Um, thank you, Liz, for inviting me today and for um, Congresswoman Barbara Lee for hosting this event. I am, um, as Liz just mentioned, the director of Saba Grocers Initiative, an Oakland-based nonprofit with a mission to increase food access by partnering um, in our neighborhoods by partnering with corner stores that already exist in food apartheid neighborhoods. Um, there's an abundance of corner stores in our neighborhoods. And after Oakland passed its soda tax in 2016 and implemented it in 2017, I was part of a group of community organizers from Oakland's Arab American Muslim community that helped organize corner store owners to advocate for the tax revenues to be invested towards structural change in our local food supply chain and primarily for a fresh produce distribution service specific to corner store needs for small orders for small orders which would um, support the vision what Candace was just saying about having better grocery stores in our neighborhoods. Um, since then, and with, our, with the support of our 
City Council, we've established a produce distribution service to corner stores, procured fresh produce from BIPOC farmers on a weekly basis from Northern California, and administered uh, financial benefits to residents shopping at corner stores through the Gus Schumacher Federal Incentive Program and Oakland's Soda Tax Food Cards Program that in essence is a universal basic income for food exclusively valid for use at local independent owned stores selling fresh produce and healthy items which keep the money which keeps the money circulating back in the economy longer and stimulates our local economy that's, that's thank nice. you lena appreciate you next um, i'd like to invite nicole gardner pronouns she her community outreach coordinator for serenity house <laughs> Good afternoon, all. I am grateful for the opportunity to be on the panel to speak about the hunger in the community, really worldwide. Um, Congressman Barbara Lee, I am grateful for the, for the opportunity to be on here with you. And we are, Serenity House is a recovery program for women. But in 2000. 19 when COVID started, we noticed the need of individuals who were hungry. Um, we are right across the street from St. Vincent de Paul. We partnered with World Central Kitchen and Community Kitchen to feed our community three times a week. Um, that lasted for quite a, a few months, but then it was cut down and then we had to purchase food on our own. And the problem that we have in our area is with the unhoused community, transportation is a barrier. So they have to go to the corner markets to get food when in actuality, if we were able to get to a supermarket, they would be able to buy more nutritional foods. Um, also, um, the foods that they have to buy at the corner market is unhealthy, which causes health issues, diabetes, health disease. Um, so that's a very heart disease. So it's just a barrier. So my concern is like the prices should be lowered. Um, the how the unhoused should be housed so they can cook their own meals. And maybe we have food drives in different communities as well as urban farming communities that would help with healthy foods for our um, unhoused, just our community in general. Um, you know, sometimes when I think back, um, I have two sons and a daughter and it were, were days that I had to go to bed hungry because I had to decide, do I eat or my children? And my children would always eat before me my children were my main concern. And so if we were able to get jobs for the community members, affordable housing, then we would have a better outlook on the hunger crisis in this area. Um, and I heard someone mention that food, some individuals that SNAP benefit, benefits are able to pay for hot, to get hot meals. But unfortunately in our area, that's not even an option because they don't have anywhere, um, they haven't been given that option to be able to get hot meals. So when it comes to even people having housing, do they pay bills or do they eat? And my concern is I want everyone to eat. I don't think any child, any adult, anyone in America should go hungry. So better, better jobs, better wages, and, and lower prices, especially for our community. And we were, we did have community market in our neighborhood, but for some reason it was closed down. So mothers, single mothers have to walk to pack and save to get the groceries. So not only are we looking to get them housed, we need to have resources for transportation that would cut some of these barriers down of unhealthy foods that the community members are eating because the foods that they're able to get are high in fats and sugars, which is not healthy. And one last thing I want to say is 
that the summer meals for that used to be distributed when school is out this summer meals are not being distributed by the schools so we have children that's at home for the summer that's going hungry and that is just totally unacceptable so i am grateful to be a part of this again and thank you all so much thank you for sharing nicole um, next i'd like to invite carrie whiteside pronouns he him uh, hope and justice senior advocate a member of the council of elders carrie take it away Good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Kerry Whiteside. Uh, I'm just recently experienced, uh, they went up on my rent and they took my food stamps because I had a part-time job. Some days I go without working, for, some months I go without working for 15 days. But then I like to talk about hunger is everybody's responsibility. You know, this young kid made a joke I won't feed nobody else's kids. It made me so angry. We are responsible for feed, feed, feeding the young, the kids. Then it's, it's a store down the street from my house. He charged double for a banana, uh, triple sometimes, uh, $1.25, $1.30. He, whatever he feel like charging for food in this store, he charges. Sometimes this, this food is expired. You got to be careful when you go in the store. Then it's a... Um, Used to be cash and carry. Anybody familiar with that? And it used to be the, I mean, it's the chef. It's called the the chef's restaurant chef for restaurants where you can go and buy and bump. But they won't take food stamps. I go in there and they have fresh food. And I say, I wonder why they won't take food stamps. Uh, so I just, you know, I just wonder what's going on in the community, uh, uh, especially in the, the poor neighborhoods. Why we can't have fresh food? You see cases and cases of beer. You see cases and cases of alcohol, but you don't see cases of green beans and things like that. One day I went walking through Jack London Square. They know it's a, where all that food come in. At. They was dumping all that food in a dumpster. Some people rather, if they can't make money off of it, they rather throw it away. And you know, it's sad. It's sad for 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 people to go hunger when they destroying when they destroying food. Uh, uh, these corner stores want to make a profit and charge extra just because people have food stamps. They want to charge extra for the for the food. I mean, triple the price. And when, so I I had gotten in the habit of going to the to the chef's market and, and, and buying stuff, and I get more. And so, but I know a lot of people can't go to a grocery store because some people can't walk. Some people need transportation. And that's all I got to say right now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing, Carrie. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to invite our longtime advocate for Alameda County Community Food Bank, Judy Jackson, pronouns she, her, hope and justice senior advocate and board member of California Alliance for Retired Americans and uh, at St. Mary's Center. Judy. Thank you. I have worked for some time to make sure that everyone has food. I was born with an ear infection and they used radiation to treat it. So at 34, I got breast cancer. And you have to give up all your retirement in order to get help with breast cancer because my retirement didn't cover it. I recovered from that and they told me, well, if you survive five years, then you are cured. And within three years, I had breast cancer again. And this time I asked them and they said, well, we don't know, there haven't been that many that survived twice. I was 34 the first time I got cancer and I couldn't get a job. I'm a teacher. I've taught for over 20 years, but they kept saying, how will we tell the kids you're dying? I wasn't dying. I was over it all. And so I had to go to the South Pacific to get a job. And when I got back from the South Pacific, trying to teach in the wintertime here in Northern California, I just got pneumonia three years in a row. 
and couldn't keep a job. And when I became homeless, I got pneumonia again. And they told me, apply for SSI. One of the things that I worry about is all the time it takes for all these things. I got housing in a little over a year, but I didn't qualify for anything else until I spent three years going through the courts and telling the judge that one day I spent all day on the bus just crying all day because I didn't know what else to do. They make things so hard for you. When you're a substitute teacher, they don't want to hire you if you don't come every time. And so sooner or later, I ended up homeless because I couldn't pay the rent. I will be happy for Representative Lee's food as medicine program because I have a digestive program problem that makes it necessary for me to have fresh fruits and vegetables in a smoothie every day. I'm just hoping that we can improve some of these programs so that everybody has a chance to have the food they need, even though they may not be able to afford it. But the SNAP program has really helped me, and I'm happy that we have all these programs to help us. Thank you for sharing, Judy. Appreciate you. We will now um, enter our Q&A with the panelists. We have a set of questions. I will ask a question, and uh, we will take one response from our, our panelists. Our first question is, why does hunger exist? Lena, would you like to take that question? Yeah, sure, I can go ahead. Um, well, we know hunger exists for many reasons, from high living costs to low wages to exploitive supply chain. But um, importantly, it, it exists because of um, government policies that led to food apartheid and food disparities in neighborhoods and across race, racial lines. What we see on the ground at Saba through our work with corner stores is that uh, food is expensive. It costs families not only money, but it costs them um, time to prepare. And when you're running, when you're when you have one or two, two to three jobs, preparing a meal is not an option. So when and when in, for example, a pound of tomatoes is a dollar ninety nine, and a bag of chips is a dollar ninety nine, um, folks are having chips for dinner, and that's that's beyond just um, inaccessibility of produce in our neighborhoods or hunger. That's a supply chain problem. That's access problem. Um, Ooh, I use that example because although this question here, we're talking about hunger today, but we're hoping for the conference in, in the fall to include policies that would be broader in understanding our food system that lead both to hunger, but also limited access to fresh produce to both residents and to corner store owners that do try and approach the terminals and are and unable to receive distribution due to their size, the disadvantage they have in the supply chain because of their small quantities and orders and lack of storage areas that they have access to. So we're hoping for the conversation to be a bit more broader in terms of systematic and structural issues that we have. And um, in terms of food access in our neighborhoods, that's important to, to continue to highlight that because in Oakland alone, um, the prediction is that one fourth of all children will develop diabetes in their lifetime and one third of black and brown children will develop the disease. And that's a systematic problem related to food apartheid and food access that both neighborhoods, neighbors living around corner stores and food apartheid areas experience and corner store owners themselves experience in accessing produce in this produce market and industry. Um, like I said earlier, for example, a corner store owner cannot get fresh produce from the market because of their small size. And um, they're disadvantaged because of their the economy of the scale and how it works. There is, however, various government policies that we can consider to bolster the access for small retailers that serve our neighborhoods with limited access to produce and um Having listening sessions around that would be helpful. Thank you, Lena. Next question. The goal of this conference is to end hunger by 2030. How do we begin to get there? What are three things you think the government should do to end hunger in America? 
Uh, please keep your answer brief. Uh, Nell, would you like to? Sure I, sure, I can start. You know, I think we can, you know, um, start by recognizing that the unpaid caring work that's done by mothers and other caregivers is work and deserves to be valued and waged. We have the uh, a Jubilee policy platform that we put forward because, you know, oftentimes, you know, we know what we're against. And here in the Poor People's Campaign, we want to be able to say what we're for. And so we have policy demands that include redefining welfare as a right that strengthens our society and provides for the general welfare, you know, to remove the stigma from receiving the programs is an important thing that needs to happen. And one of one of the things that can do that is by saying that a child al allowance, which is one of the recommendations to end child poverty, that recognizes the, the importance of the caregiving work that's being done. And so, you know, we urge that uh, that everybody, that we develop a moral agenda, that we um, address the, the, the needs by requiring um, that corporations pay their fair share, that the wealthy pay their fair share, that these programs, you know, people, because in, in many conversations that I have, people say, well, who's going to pay for it? Where's the money going to come from? And so what we want to say is that there is plenty of money, that there's a distorted moral narrative that says that we're poor and hungry because of some personal thing that we did or didn't do right. But what we know is that a $7.25 an hour federal minimum wage will not provide enough resource for housing and food and the other needs that, that we have. So that is not a personal problem. That is a policy decision. And so we want, you know, policies that reflect our right to live and the need for the uh, the wealth of the society to be shared among those of us who are creating it. Thank you, Nell. Our next question, and again, please keep your answers brief. What do you think would surprise people about your personal experience with hunger? Please unmute yourself and, and help answer. We'll take one, one response. I think I spoke of that <clears throat> previously, but it was a decision that I would have to make uh, whether I would eat or my children would eat. And so it would have to be my children. You know, we all needed the nutritional values, but it was most important that they eat so they could, you know, go to school, but it would be that my that I had to make that decision on who was going to eat. So that's a hard decision to make, especially if you have more than two children and you're really trying to make ends meet. Because the SNAP benefits, they don't really go that far when you're trying to feed your family, again, nutritionist meals. Thank you. Our next question. How have existing federal nutrition programs like CalFresh, WIC, and School Meals helped ensure that you and your family get the nutrition you need? We will take one response. Uh, please go ahead and unmute. Anyone? I think that SNAP has helped me get the fruits and vegetables that I need. Uh, it seems like even when I was in the shelter, they often feed uh, sweetened cereal for breakfast. How can you do that if you're asthmatic and can't use the milk and you're diabetic and don't need the sugar? So I think some of these programs need to take into account special needs of people. Thank you. Um, our next question, why do you think the government should invest more in these and other federal nutrition programs to make them better? Judy, would you like to take that one as well? Yes, I've seen more and more 
that the congregate meals that I occasionally go visit at St. Mary's, they're having to charge extra for seconds because the money just doesn't go along. I've seen that the meals on wheels, the last time I got those before I got a helper for me, only eight of the meals all month were anything but chicken or turkey. These programs are supposed to help people, but people have to live on them day after day. And that kind of cutting of because of costs doesn't help people. Thank you, Judy. I also want to take a brief moment to let our audience know that we will be running over just a few minutes, um, but we will get through our questions and uh, some final remarks. Our next question is, how would more adequate wages, better job opportunities, more affordable housing and health care help you and your family put food on the table? Carrie, would you like to take that? Yes, my name is Carrie. Uh, for me, it's like... Uh, it's a it's a it's a no win situation, you know. Like you be on uh, SSI, then you get a, a disability or a retirement. You know, you only get so much money a month. And so when you uh, start working, they start going up on your rent. So they they done recently tripled my rent. So and they cut the food stamps because I'm working. So it's sometimes it feel like you you can't win. It's a no win situation. But the government just look and give some kind of lead, leeway because the job I got is only like sometimes you might, uh, like I say, you only work 15 days out of a month and you might be off 15 days, you know. So so I have to really, really buckle down and budget myself and, and, and like I say, try to try to buy, you know, a lot of beans and rice and stuff like that. I also like to... Uh, work on my health too. So I like to get smoothies and vegetables and make smoothies, and, uh, things of that nature, it's, you know, fresh fruits and stuff. But it's just, it's just sometimes uh, in my neighborhood, it's just hard, they're hard to get. So government needs to look more into that too. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. And our last question for tonight, what tough choices do you have to make when there is not enough food available for you and your family? Um, we'll take one response. Uh, please go ahead and unmute. So I can say that sometimes I have felt like I had to make the choice between whether or not I was gonna commit what's considered to be a crime to have what I need. And I, I think we should stop criminalizing poverty, stop arresting people who are trying to provide for their own most basic needs, stop calling it a crime and provide us with the resources that we need to meet our needs as the policymakers have. We only want for ourselves what we, they want for themselves, housing, food, transportation, healthcare, right? Just the most basic things. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank all of our wonderful panelists for sharing your incredible insights and your personal stories with us. Um, I'd now like to turn it over to Representative Lee to provide your final remarks. You're on mute, Congresswoman Lee. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. You okay. Yeah, Th thanks so much for moderating this very important discussion. And um, what you have highlighted again is that this is a, a hunger, food insecurity is, is a moral issue. Uh, and it's, it's uh, un-American, quite frankly, that um, we have hunger in America. All of your stories and what you have shared with me tonight, believe you me, will move forward and I will put forward with the White House conference. It's so important that um, I heard you tonight in terms of all of the recommendations that you had, because not only did you talk about what the issues are and how they're impacting your lives, but also what we need to do and how we need to make sure we correct these um, injustices. And that's what they are. So thank you all again so much. We definitely will follow up and we look forward to this White House conference, but your stories, uh, you have shared them with a lot of passion, but a lot of clarity, with a lot of dignity, and um, 
just know that you have a lot of people uh, working with you to make sure that we lift everyone out of poverty so that everyone has the opportunity to live the American dream. Right now, we're at that point where um, we can either go forwards or backwards. And we definitely intend to move forward to make sure that uh, this conversation does not have to happen uh, again. Thank you again. Thank you once again, Congresswoman Lee, for your incredible leadership in the fight to eradicate hunger. I would also like to reiterate my gratitude to our panelists for sharing your lived experiences and proposals for making a hunger-free nation by 2030 a reality. Now we want to hear from you, our audience. Uh, we urge you to share your stories and ideas about how to end hunger by 2030 by filling out the Google form survey at the link we will provide at the close of this event. We also urge you to sign up for the Food Bank's Advocacy Action Alerts by logging on to accfb.org uh, backslash advocacy. You will receive instructions on quick and effective ways to message your elected officials, urging them to pass legislation such as Congresswoman, Congresswoman Lee's very own Improving Access to Nutrition Act and related work such as the Closing the Meal Gap Act. And finally, ensure that no one goes hungry by sharing information about food bank services and assistance at foodnow.net and comidaahora.net. It has been an honor to share the space with Representative Lee, California Association of Food Banks, our panelists, and you watching at home. On behalf of Alameda County Community Food Bank, we look forward to working with you all on our shared mission to eradicate hunger. Good night.